False Evidence of Evolution, Part 2. In the first film in our False Evidence of Evolution series, we saw some of the fake evidence evolutionists produce as part of their effort to keep their theory alive. We witnessed how the theory of evolution has been refuted by science at every step and how it is a deception maintained by means of various frauds in order to cover up the fact of creation. In this second part of the series, which unmasks the true face of the theory of evolution, we shall continue to examine the hoaxes perpetrated by some evolutionists. We will learn with horror how laboratory experiments performed by evolutionists in order to bring an evolutionary explanation to bear on how life first emerged have ended in fiasco. How they have manufactured fake fossils by sticking together the fossil bones of living things that existed at very different times. How fishermen caught living specimens of the coelacanth, which evolutionists claim to be a so-called intermediate form, half fish and half reptile in the transition from water to land and the ridiculous position in which evolutionists found themselves when it transpired to be nothing more than an ordinary species of fish. How they misled the public by exhibiting an imaginary fossil they made from plastic bones, depicting it as an intermediate form in museums for some 100 years. How they added fraud to barbarity by kidnapping an African pygmy and locking him in a cage in American zoos, displaying him as supposed living evidence of evolution. Evolutionists generally point unwisely to the Miller experiment as a so-called evidence for their deceit regarding how what they refer to as primordial life emerged on Earth spontaneously. The fact is, however, that this experiment performed around half a century ago lost all credibility in the face of subsequent scientific discoveries. In 1953, the American chemist Stanley Miller formed an experiment in order to support the scenario of molecular evolution. Miller assumed that the primordial atmosphere consisted of methane, ammonia and hydrogen gases. He combined these gases in an experimental apparatus and passed an electric current through the mixture. A week or so later, he saw that a few amino acids had formed in that part of the apparatus known as the cold trap. This caused enormous excitement among evolutionists. Over the next 20 years, certain evolutionists such as Sidney Fox and Cyril Penomporuma attempted to continue with Miller's scenario. Discoveries made in the 1970s, however, invalidated all these evolutionist endeavors known as the primordial atmosphere experiments. Because scientific findings showed that the primordial atmosphere on Earth did not consist of the gases methane and ammonium, as Miller had hypothesized, but of nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. Miller had carefully selected the gases he used in his experiment because these were ideally suited to the formation of amino acids. However, the structure of the atmosphere in the primordial world was very definitely not suited to the emergence of amino acids. It was also realized that there was a high level of free oxygen in the primordial atmosphere. This invalidated the evolutionist scenario because it was obvious that free oxygen would immediately break down amino acids. Moreover, Miller intervened in the experiment through various conscious mechanisms such as the cold trap, by way of which he was able to isolate the amino acids that formed before they could be broken down again. Were it not for equipment such as the cold trap, 
a source of sparks and other chemicals that emerged during the course of the experiment, the amino acids that appeared would have immediately broken down again. In this way, Miller himself destroyed the evolutionist hypotheses regarding amino acids being able to form spontaneously under natural conditions, because there was no such controlled mechanism as evolutionists claim in the primordial world capable of separating amino acids that might form before they were broken down. In conclusion, far from documenting that life could emerge spontaneously in nature, all these efforts actually showed that it could not even be produced under laboratory conditions. In the light of these findings, in the 1980s, the scientific world admitted that the Miller experiment and the primordial atmosphere experiments of those who came after him were actually meaningless. After a long silence, Miller himself confessed that the experiment he conducted in 1953 was a far cry from accounting for the origin of life. The evolutionist and scientist Harold Urey who performed the experiment in question together with Miller, made the following admission. All of us who study the origin of life find that the more we look into it, the more we feel it is too complex to have evolved anywhere. We all believe as an article of faith that life evolved from dead matter on this planet. It is just that its complexity is so great, it is hard for us to imagine that it did. The 50 years or so that have passed in the meantime have served only to better display the hopeless position of the theory of evolution at the molecular level. Yet it is a most interesting fact that the Miller experiment is still depicted as if it is a scientific evidence for evolution in a great many biology textbooks. An article published in National Geographic's magazine in 1999 announced the discovery in China of a fossil known as Archaeoraptor. The report contained evolutionist indoctrination along the lines of, in the same way that we can be certain that human beings are mammals, so we may be sure that birds are theropods. Theropods are a kind of dinosaur, and the fossil discovered was depicted as definitive proof of the idea that birds evolved from dinosaurs. The species, which was said to have lived around 125 million years ago, was given the name Archaeoraptor leongensis. Fictitious illustrations in the magazine depicted dinosaurs covered in feathers, leaping into the air and then beginning to fly by growing wings. Yet this fossil, announced to the accompaniment of great fanfare by National Geographic, soon turned into a source of terrible embarrassment for the magazine known for its pro-Darwinist stance. In fact, the fossil did not belong to a species exhibiting both bird and dinosaur characteristics, as National Geographic had claimed. Although the fossil had a beak with teeth and a bird-like body, its tail resembled that of a dinosaur known as the dromaeosaur. The fossil was actually a hoax. It had been deliberately assembled from more than one fossil in such a way as to give the impression of representing a supposed intermediate form and used as evidence for evolution. Evolutionists had learned nothing from the Piltdown Man affair in which an orangutan and human bones had been assembled together and this time portrayed a hoax fossil put together from dinosaur and bird bones as proof of evolution.